The video you're about to watch is a recording of a presentation that my husband Donovan Thesinga and I, Susan Thesinga, gave about the history of Seven Oaks, the spiritual center we co-founded in 1972. This video includes slides showing the creation of Seven Oaks and the history of this light center up until the year 2002 when our last major building was created, which is called Lighthouse. This building was also the setting for the event that was recorded in July of 2013, seven years ago. Most of the audience then were people who helped create this center. We are now offering this video to a general audience. It has been nearly 50 years since Seven Oaks began as a center of light. The center is still here, and so are we. We celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary this fall. We named this DVD, A Greater Capacity to Experience Life. This phrase comes from a pathwork lecture called, What is the Path? It says, every human being senses an inner longing that goes deeper than the longings for emotional and creative fulfillment. This longing comes from a sensing that another, more fulfilling state of consciousness and a greater capacity to experience life exists. The longing which you and every other human being senses comes from and leads toward that more fulfilling state of consciousness. That inner reality is always and already alive and well within us. It has many names. The pathwork calls it our real self. The path to that inner reality comes through the practice of being real, being honest with ourselves and others moment to moment staying open and present to our own experience, whatever it may be. As we learn to be more real, more honest, the deeper we go into ourselves. And as we do that, we come closer to knowing and embodying the deepest inner reality of what we are. Along the way, we expand our capacity to experience all of life. We drop our defenses, we open to our human trauma and pain and limitation. And as we do that, we also allow the joy and expansion of reconnecting to our essential spiritual nature. The Pathwork invites us to step fully into this adventure of life, <clears throat> trusting our longing to lead us home. The Pathwork is a contemporary spiritual path. It is deeply linked to the mission of Seven Oaks, uh, which is the only physical Pathwork Center that is where Pathwork is practiced in many parts, though pa Pathwork is practiced in many parts of the world. Physically, Seven Oaks is 130 acres of rural land with river frontage, mountain views, a pond, miles of hiking trails through healthy woods with abundant wildlife. Seven Oaks is located in southern Madison County, Virginia, a half hour north of Charlottesville, Virginia, and two hours southwest of Washington, D.C. Over the years, Seven Oaks has become a spiritual home to many. It's a beautiful nature sanctuary for humans to do their inner work, to come into greater union with themselves, with nature, with other humans, and with the divine. Hundreds of people have been touched and even transformed by the inner work they have done at Seven Oaks. Seven Oaks has been called an island of sanity. It is a place where masks come off, where truth is spoken, where realness is respected. All have left Seven Oaks with a greater capacity to experience life. I want to clarify that this DVD of Seven Oaks history, narrated by Donovan and me, naturally reflects our personal experience of Seven Oaks.
As such, we share our own journey, which has included many flavors of the one universal spiritual path. While the path work has been a steady source of inspiration since 1972 to the present, we have also been students of Zen Buddhism, Christian mysticism, the awakening teachings from many traditions and teachers, Native American practices, and Amazonian shamanism. Each has offered us new tools through which to expand our own capacity to experience life. Seven Oaks, on the other hand, has retained a singular identification with the pathwork ever since this land was dedicated as a pathwork center in 1976. Stewardship of Seven Oaks is the responsibility of the Mid-Atlantic Pathwork. The Pathwork is not associated with any other spiritual path, though it is compatible with many. While our personal life story is deeply intertwined with that of Seven Oaks, we wanted to clarify that this DVD mixes our personal path with Seven Oaks history in ways that might be confusing to some people. For example, Donovan's and my pursuit of Amazonian shamanism included the ritual use of the psychoactive tea ayahuasca in the context of spiritual ceremony of the Brazilian religion of the Santo Daime. This path had a significant impact on us for over 10 years, though that is no longer the case. The path work, however, does not advocate the use of any psychoactive substances and has no organizational association with the Santo Daime religion or with any other religion. As another example, our personal story includes having an adopted daughter who grew up at Seven Oaks. This again is part of our personal story and not necessarily relevant to others' experience of this place. Many other people have also lived at Seven Oaks. Currently, for example, we have two other Pathwork people living here and we're open to more residential community. For anyone interested, the Pathwork teachings are contained in 258 lectures channeled by Eva Paracas until her death in 1979. If you are interested in knowing more, the websites where you can read the Pathwork lectures for free, as well as the website for the Pathwork in our region, including a special section for alumni of our programs, and the website for Seven Oaks will be listed. My book, The Undefended Self, summarizes the Pathwork teachings. I hope you will enjoy hearing this history from us. If you want, let us know your reactions through comments left here. Thank you. I want to deeply welcome you all here. It feels very uh, full to have this room so filled with friends that go back to the beginning of Seven Oaks and those who never set foot on the property till this morning. So we have the whole range and I welcome you all deeply. So we have prepared a gift for you and I encourage you to simply receive Relax and receive this gift. And this is not, it is on, on one level a gift that Kent and Donovan and I have prepared for you, this slideshow. But at a much deeper level, it is really the gift of all that has transpired, all that has been given in these 40 years on this property. All that you have experienced here, all that you have given, all that you have loved, all that you have felt. It's all to be received tonight. So just receive quietly Seven Oaks.
Okay, and we're going to pause on this slide. Uh, Karen Milnick named this slide Oak Light. And I've been through thousands, as you can imagine, thousands of photos and slides of Seven Oaks and people and history and very rich tapestry we've created here. And in the end, this came to me to be sort of the emblematic image of our whole 40 years here and what Seven Oaks is all about. We have come together here in the protected shelter of an ancient oak grove to learn to dance in the light of our own being. To see this light, which is the light of love and the light of truth in ourselves and in one another. We have also come here to let this light penetrate deep into ourselves and especially to all the denser levels of our psyche. To let this light illuminate our darkest, most shameful, most vulnerable, our scared, most scared places inside. And to let this light teach us total acceptance and total forgiveness. Over time, we learn to relax more and more and let this light dance in and through us and all of life, no matter what. A number of people have asked us, especially recently, thinking about this show tonight, have asked us, well, what did you have in mind when you started Seven Oaks? What was your intention? And uh, as I think about that, I think, well, we didn't have a whole lot in mind. Uh, we didn't, certainly didn't have a clear intention. We were just following our hearts and following what we wanted to do and what was fun. And uh, we certainly didn't have a business plan. In fact, I think I'd never heard of the term before. And I still don't know what our business plan is. I sh we certainly didn't have it back then. We just were following our hearts and what excited us and what turned us on and what we wanted to do. So. Uh, all the same, though, several years later, after we discovered Eva's teachings, uh, I did run across a uh, uh, saying that seems to fit. Uh, this is a quote from the guide. Every, every human being senses an inner longing that another more fulfilling state of consciousness and a larger capacity to experience life must exist. I think whether you've ever thought those words consciously to yourself, that's what brought you here, something very much like that. There's something more than just doing your job and earning your pay and blah, 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 all the stuff. There's learning that there is something deeper in us that we can, through our own efforts, with the help of others, uncover, and it will lead to having a more bigger, more enjoyable, more profound experience of life. So that's what I think was motivating us then and now. Susan and I were both very much uh, products of the 60s, the late 60s. And uh, what, were the, what were some of the values then? Certainly openness, honesty, not hiding, finding your real self, letting yourself be seen, uh, paying attention to the heart and the feelings, not just the mind and its thoughts. And there was a belief, and I think an experience, that doing all that would help you learn how to be happier, healthier, in a sense, bigger. Uh, places back then that did this kind of work were called growth centers, to grow, grow yourself. Next slide. So the place that Susan and I got a lot from in the late 60s was Esalen Institute out in Big Sur, California. Beautiful place look, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And uh, first time I ever went to Esalen, uh, it was so exciting, so enthralling for me. I threw myself into it so totally, and it was such a big experience that right then and there I decided I'm going to change my career. I want to start learning to do what that guy who led this group is doing, and I'm going to learn that, and I did. And it's 
became my career. Even more important than that, if you can imagine something more important, it's when I met Susan. <laughs> Far out. I mean, that was a that was a big week, you know. <laughs> Changed my career and met my wife. No I'm kidding. <laughs> And uh, to, just to show you the kind of, uh, to indicate the kind of um, behavior that was sort of promoted and, and learned at Esalen, uh, uh, I'll say first that I came from New York City. I had, this was the first time I had ever done anything like this. Was a, I was brand new, really just blue. So I was just got off the plane. I was kind of tense. All right, what are they going to do here? Uh, Susan was in the same group. And she was living in D.C., but at that time she had been bumming around, having a good time in California for months. She'd found a terrific job that paid her to go to all these workshops. And so she was, she was really well loosened up by this point, and I was still pretty tight. And so the, uh, the leader announces, you know, the group is starting on Sunday night, and there's a go-around, like people are saying their, their name and a few things about themselves. And when he gets to Susan, the, the leader, uh, Susan says, uh, Something, a couple of words about herself, and then she says, but you know, th th my arms feel funny. They feel sort of itchy. And the, the group leader said, well, look around. Is there anyone in this room that you want to hug? And Susan stands up, points across the room at me, and says, I want to hug him. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I thought, boy, they, sh they sure uh, are different out here. <laughs> <laughs> so she came across the room, gave me a big hug, and I said, this may be part of quite a week. You know? <laughs> so, next slide. We had a, yeah, next slide. Uh, oh, right a minute. No, nope. right. back, back to that one okay. for a little while. Um, Which one, Esalen? I like Esalen for a little while longer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I really threw myself into that weekend, so did Susan, and the fact that we were both in it and very attracted to each other, and we would get together, and then we would fight and explode, and it was like, we both learned a lot. I learned a whole new world of uh, how to behave and get out of my mask and into my real self. And um, yeah, move to the next one. Okay, when I was back at Esalen, I say I realized I had never done individual work with anyone, any kind of individual therapy. So I asked several people at Esalen, who, I, who is the best person in New York City? And every one of them answered, John Paracas. That's the fellow on the right. He and Al Lowen were partners at that time. They were both pretty famous people in New York and some other circles. They, uh, Al wrote a lot of books. And John, was, John and Al together co-created bioenergetics, which is a really powerful new method of doing therapy. And, uh, I felt a stronger heart connection to John. I signed up as his client. After a few months, I said, John, uh, I want to learn what you're doing. Would you take me on as your apprentice? To my, to my, I'm still touched to this day. He said, yes. I mean, only, I'd only been there three months. He said, he, he sized me up and he said, yes. So from that moment on, every time he did a workshop, I came along as his unpaid assistant. And after about the second one, he would throw me out and say, okay, what would, you're, you're working with the next person. <laughs> and uh, it was really like learning, learning by doing and learning by fire by, from a master. It was really fantastic. And um, uh, the fact that he saw my potential and uh, trusted it so much and sort of threw me in there was, it was very validating to me. I, I, he was like an a, um, intense spiritual father for me. Uh, so uh, I went to, at the same time I was apprenticing with John, I was uh, signed up as a student in the ongoing bioenergetic training that both Lowen and Paracas were leading. Uh, Susan, at the same time, had also met John down in D.C. And uh, she'd gone back to D.C., I'd gone to New York. But one day in a session, I was working with John, talking to him about my issues with women and how I'd never been really seriously involved with a woman, just never been deeply into a relationship. And he said, you know, he said, a couple of times when you talked about that young woman you met in California, your voice has a different quality. And that's all he said. And I left there and I thought, I'm going to call her up. <laughs> I did. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm coming down to see you this weekend. She says, uh, um, when? I said, you know, Saturday. She says, I got a date planned for Saturday night. I said, well, I think you ought to cancel it. And she said, <laughs> <laughs> why in the world would I do that? I said, I'm really up for a serious relationship now, and I think you may be the person. So it, this is really worth your while. <laughs> and she canceled her, her date, and we uh, started getting together. A while later, I invited her to join me in New York, and she moved into my apartment in Christopher Street in the Grand Village. 
And uh, we really um, opened up a lot of life together. Not only our relationship with each other, we were both studying yoga for the first time and meditation. And uh, I was reading a lot about Zen, and I had become a, a Zen student with, with Hiroshi. And Susan eventually joined me. And um, in late 1970, we had a marriage. We were married in a Zen ceremony with uh, Hiroshi. Oh. This comes that, before I forgot the, that slide was there. This, this is a, maybe a good, Susan put that in there, I think, because it shows the kind of quality of energy and love between us. And uh, uh, it also shows exactly the, the level at, uh, of sideburns that men were supposed to wear in those days. <laughs> 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 All right, next slide. There's our wedding. Uh, the rosary is just to the right. We don't have him. He's, in the picture, he was a bald-headed looking fellow, distinguished fellow. But it, was a, it was an important marriage ceremony for us. I, what I remember about the vows was we vow to be each other's partner on this spiritual path through life, and we vow to be each other's principal helper and teacher. Okay? And that's, we remember that a lot. It's so. Been uh, true. We were both serious practitioners. Next slide. Look at that fantastic posture Susan has. <laughs> and look at, the, look at all the length of those legs. <laughs> all right. I was struck by both of those things myself. <laughs> a day after we got married at a Zen center in Rochester, New York, we got into our VW van and came down to Virginia. There we are. To start a new life. Uh, we came to Virginia because uh, Susan knew very slightly a couple of people who said they were starting a beginning little tiny growth center in rural Virginia. And we said, wow, you are. Can we come down and lead workshops there? And they said, oh, of course you can. You know, anybody can. So, yeah. <laughs> was that kind of a day? <laughs> <laughs> if you have enough nerve to do it, you can do it. Yeah, sure. So we uh, started leading workshops. And... Uh, uh, spirit must have really been with us because in the second weekend workshop I ever led, at the end of the workshop, which was really powerful, a woman came up to me and said she was a feature writer for the Washington Post. And she said, this was really good. And she says, then the way you talk about it is very good. She says, I would like to come back in a couple of weeks or you know, a month and uh, go through the whole workshop and as a participant and write it up and I'll bring a cameraman who'll take pictures at the end. And so she did that. And very soon we had a big spread in the Washington Post. It was the whole front page of the style section with a big picture of me wrestling with one of the people in the workshop and a couple more pages inside. And I was like, what a shot in the arm for someone who was just getting started in this profession, you know. And uh, the, the main uh, growth center in, in D.C. then was Quest. They called me up and said, would you like to start doing some workshops for us? And I get in our calendar and I said, yes. I also rented space for them and started a therapy practice. Just They were in Bethesda, Maryland. I started a therapy practice just based on people who were coming to my workshops and saying, do you do private work too? <laughs> and I said, well, I will. <laughs> so, okay. Anyway, it was like a really exciting new life. We, we, we lived in a, a rented house in Rappahannock County and uh, really loved living in the country for the first time in a long time. Next slide. Uh, after about a year and a half of being very successful at the workshops and crowding people into our little little rented farmhouse, we realized we needed to own our own place. I mean, uh, uh, landlords, just once, once they found out, would just get sort of freaked out about uh, what we're doing. So uh, here I am leading some Byron Jack uh, with an individual man, and here's a group. And it seems to me that this, as far as I could tell, this was the first time that Byron Jack had come to the Virginia, Maryland, D.C. region. No one had heard of it before, but uh, it was a big deal in New York at the time, and you know they picked it up in California. But I think it was the first time it was here, and it was—it's a strong way to work with people. So, uh, and I was really into it. It had been great for me. So, uh, next slide. You need it. Yeah. yeah. So we uh, put out the word to everyone who came to our groups. We need to buy property. We didn't know what else to do. We just, so we just told everyone we knew, we need to buy property. And sure enough, before long, uh, a woman came up to us who uh, knew that I had worked with John Paracas. She was impressed with that because years and years ago, she had been a client of Wilhelm Reich. And John Paracas, of course, was a student of Wilhelm Reich. So she said, you worked with John Paracas. She said, well, I worked with And so we had a lot of exchange with that. And she 
loved to make a connection with us. And she, I, I said, well, what we need is just, you know, I think, just a, a, a house and 10 acres. And she said, well, I, I was thinking of selling you 130 acres. How about that? And I said, well, we'll, we'll go look at it. So, here is uh, Oak House. And uh, it was sort of the, the house itself and the, and the right around it, it didn't look to me like uh, um, a place that was two hours west of D.C. It looked to me like an old, beat-up, abandoned ranch somewhere in the middle of Wyoming. <laughs> it just looked really ratty and funky, and, and there was a dirt road outside and a dirt road in, and it was like, it was in bad shape. Uh, no one had farmed it. They'd just been grazing it, and the, all the land was overgrazed, and all the slopes were eroding, and the red clay was showing through. The house had an outhouse, no bathrooms, no plumbing, no heat source, no insulation in the walls. You could say it needed work. So uh, <laughs> here I am standing in front of, you know, Oak House now. It's got dormers, and it's, it's a much nicer building. And, but at that time, it was, upstairs was just an unfinished attic. And uh, we didn't know how we were going to lead groups here or how we were going to make it work. But we looked out at the view of the mountains, and we felt inside, and we thought, we're supposed to be here. This is a gift. This lady's given us a gift. She, she enabled us to pay, she enabled us to purchase the land without a down payment. Because we didn't have a down payment. <laughs> we didn't have any money. But she said, I will make the payments such as you can get it paid off in X number of years. So we, we said, okay. Um, next slide. Uh, I was newly moved from New York City, where I lived for the last 11 years, and I was happy to be in the country, and I wanted to start a garden, and it was just rough clay soil in the back of the house, so I bought a pickup truck, and I was very thrilled to find a, a, a local uh, a horse barn where I could uh, uh, take out their straw with manure, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I could fill a pickup truck and bring it back here and, and dig it in and make a garden. So uh, I was very happy to be doing this kind of outdoor, manly work. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, take a look at the building in the back is a, is a collapsed and falling down barn. It was still sort of hanging together there, but n you'll notice it has a lot of uh, siding on it. Uh, remember that, I'll, I'll mention it in a minute. Okay, there's the barn with the siding taken off and the rest of the barn collapsed, and that's the little bit that was left. Okay, uh, here we are in the front yard of Oak House. There's our VW van on the left, and it was, uh, uh, it was muddy. It had car parts sitting around. We had one great big engine right in the front yard, with right blocking the view. It was this car engine, like an old Plymouth or something, and uh, it, it, it had not been very well taken care of. <laughs> Next picture. So it also had a couple of <laughs> horses that had the run of the mill. They just kept running all over. The, they belonged to a neighbor, but they were not tame. They were they had gone wild. And the driveways you see that went right between the oaks was a muddy mess, and the whole place was a muddy mess. But we thought, well. It's got promise. <laughs> okay. That's the original corn crib. You know, there's a building here called Corn Crib. Well, that's what it was. It was just a roof under which the farmer stored corn, right? And that was, that car was his pride and joy that he was saving for some purpose. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we thought it was quaint and head charming. So we, we, we took the place. Go ahead. This is a view looking east from Oak House, that is looking to, back towards the road, back towards the uh, mailbox. And that's all totally forest now. And you can see then it was no forest at all. That, you, that thing you see coming in from the right is actually a tree that was uh, at Oak House and is through the window, sort of blocking the view. But really it was like, there's the mature forest up there, which is behind what's now Susan is my house. And in the right, can you point it out? There's, a, there's some there's, what's at, that's actually a teepee that a, per, that a friend of ours put up there. Uh, and uh, between that teepee and Oak House, there were hardly any trees. It was all just overgrazed grazing land. And that's an old tenant house that was in process of falling down, and it fell down a few years later. Go ahead. This is a plat. Uh, it's an aerial picture of uh, Seven Oaks. And uh, Susan may show you the outline of the uh, property. Can you do that? It's the road. That's, that's, that's the county road, yeah. And this is the driveway in, uh -huh. which is the uh, boundary. North, ba north boundary. This is the river, the Rapidan, Rapidan river, river, and the south boundary. Yeah. Now, all of that 
white space is open grazing land. It's only, it's only the dark space that were trees. And that place that says 3.6, that's the, that's the campus. That was about 3.6 acres. That's the, what's now the buildings run. But when we looked at all this eroded land, uh, we wondered what to do with it. And our neighbor on the north, on the, on the other side, was, was the farmer who grazed cattle there. And he t really did his best to talk me into being, becoming a cattle rancher. He says, it's easy money. You don't have to do much work. You just grow, raise them up and slaughter them and kill them. It's good. And uh, I was tempted for a while because he was so persuasive about it. But for the first time in my life, because I was, I was trying to understand the concept of guidance, acting by guidance. So for the first time in my life that I consciously sought guidance, I was about, should I invest in cattle? <laughs> and I, you know, it's a very practical matter. <laughs> but I was told guidance could work for anything. So I meditated one day and asked this question. And to my amazement, I heard a voice in my head saying, cattle, no. So I addressed it. I said, all right, no cattle. And we decided instead to plant a forest in that space east of Oak House. We found uh, the, the Virginia Department of Forestry gave us 9,000 tree, little tree seedlings about this hull, virtually for free. We hired a local farmer with his tractor and an apparatus on the, on the back of it that would open a furrow in the ground. And his, the, the farmer's young son, about 10 years old, sat on that thing and, and put little tree seedlings in the furrow. And Susan and I walked along behind him and stomped down to close the furrow. And it's a very simple action we did. But to do it 9,000 times, you start, <laughs> you start to notice it. <laughs> Your legs feel it. Okay. But we planted a forest in that area. Rather than say, we're going to keep the forest down and, and turn it over to cattle, we're going to make it a forest. And it's been a thrill over the years to see that forest grow up to the point where it's a mature forest right now. Yeah. OK. Want to go ahead, honey? Yes. Okay, this is the view looking uh, west from the Oak House. At that time, you could, from, from Oak House, you could look all the way down to the, what we call the lower 40, that, that big field between us and the river. Well, it was a field then. You can actually, in one of these, I think maybe this one, you can see the river over there. Mm -hmm. you can, so you can see the river. That's the edge. And they actually had planted, they planted corn in that field year after year, which is a terrible thing to do to land because it, it leaches a lot of so we stopped the, the 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 grazing and we stopped the growing of corn and we let the trees go back and we planted trees it's that same view in the winter so the first thing we did uh, donovan mentioned that oak house was barely livable so the first thing we did was finish oak house uh, this of course is a much classier looking place and we added one dormer and a, uh, when we could get the money, we added the second dormer, uh, changed the porch. So here's just a couple views of Oak House. And in the process of putting in the second dormer, we hired a local roofer. Turned out to be Keith Covington. So you never know how people are going to be find their way to the spiritual path. This is another picture of So uh, at that time, before we go to Eva, can I just say that at that time, like, I was, I was commuting to D.C. a lot, uh, going to my practice in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, working a lot. And Susan, mostly, a lot that, for a while, I was staying a lot at Seven Oaks and supervising the, the uh, reconstruction of the house. And um, I was also periodically going back to New York to continue my bioenergetic training with Lowen and Paracas. And sometimes Susan came along with me. So. In the summer of 72, we, we were at, bought Seven Oaks in March of 72. And in the summer of 72, I went to a bioenergetic training with Lowen and Paracas. And John brought his wife, his new wife, Eva. Uh, and this picture of me with Eva is now. This, uh, to say this picture of me and Eva received more hits on Facebook than any <laughs> other picture I've ever posted. I mean, many people got the energy from this picture. Uh, it was a profound experience for me meeting her. I, it, I, it's like I had, was love at first sight. I immediately knew that this woman was who I had been looking for as the spiritual mother and mentor and guide 
that I, ha that I most needed. Uh, and I asked to start working with her, and then I started going up that fall to New York once a month when the guide lectures were given, and at the same time having a session with Eva. I commuted by bus from Madison, Virginia to New York City, <laughs> you know, and uh, arriving back at 4 a.m., I think. Anyway, it was the, the draw to be with her was just inc very, very strong. The first lecture I ever attended was lecture 213, Let Go and Let God. Quite a lecture. And I had the experience that this, uh, every word was speaking to me. It was exactly where I was and what I needed to hear. It's all about how to really let go in your interpersonal relationship. And it's, it's, it's critical to be able to let the other person go and, uh, and trust in God. I f later found out that every person in that room, of whom there must have been 50 or 70, all felt that the every <laughs> word of that lecture was directed to them. <laughs> so that was not an unusual experience. But it did feel like an extraordinary privilege to be in the presence of Eva channeling. It was certainly at that time the strongest experience of being in the presence of the divine that I had ever had. So I kept coming back. 1972 was quite a year f for us. Not only did we buy Seven Oaks, and J John and Eva and the people close to them invested in and bought a property in Phoenicia, New York that same year. And that's one of the buildings in Phoenicia. This is one of their truly happy times in Phoenicia. And then I met Eva so that the two centers and our two work were instantly joined. The interesting thing, I've always thought it interesting that we'd been living in New York. We could have connected to the path work then, but if we had, we never would have moved, you know, because it was, it was the spiritual path that spoke to us uh, at that time. And so we had to come all the way down here and then start commuting back to New York. <laughs> so. All right. At this time, we were, you know, prior to this, for the first couple of years, we were we had only Oak House, and uh, that meant that Susan and I did everything. We bought all the groceries for the forthcoming workshop. Susan prepared all the meals in the little Oak House kitchen. We used the, the one decent-sized room as a group room, uh, but when it was a, ceased being a group room, it was everybody's bedroom because we didn't have much space, and uh, the, the mass that you sat on on the floor during the group room became your bed, and we, <laughs> we didn't have any furniture. We didn't have the room for furniture, nor the money to buy it. And upstairs in the attic, half of the attic became our little space, and the other half was more mats on the floor for the for participants. It was really roughing it, and we didn't, so we couldn't charge much for workshops, but people just kept coming, and it was, you know, we were working most weekends. So at this, uh, next slide. So I remember that picture of the corn crib. I thought, what can we do for more space? I thought, well, that's a good metal roof. We don't want to waste that. We don't have a whole lot of money. There's a good metal roof there. We're going to build up to it, all right? And so a, a local construction guy showed me how to dig a foundation, and I dug with a pick and shovel the foundation for the, for the north half of that building. And um, for the rest of it, it's end. interesting to do. Uh, and, I'd never done any work like that before. And then we made a barter deal with some people, about six or seven people who lived at the Twin Oaks community to come up and do the rest of the building of that side and in return for our doing psychological and emotional work with them and helping them with the, their, their group dynamics, okay? So we finished the north-hand side of the corn crib and the gray siding was torn off the barn. Remember the gray siding? It wasn't, we tore it off, we recut it and put it on the corn crib and thought we were very smart <laughs> and frugal. Okay, then after another year or so, we needed, and we, you know, put more mats on, on the floor. And over by, after another year or so, we thought we need more room, so we started the south half. And here is Alan Hill, uh, the man on the left, working, and a few other people at the, and there's Keith Covington, and several other people who were interested in the path work at that time by that, and so they would volunteer their work, basically. They said, hey, I like what you're doing. I want to hang out with you, and uh, we got some carpentry skills. So they built the south side of the corn crib. Yeah, there's Keith again. All right. 
At this point, we had already ripped all the, all the siding off the barn, so we had to buy new siding for the, for the barn. Next slide. So there's the completed, and you can see the left side is new siding, and the right-hand side is gray siding. We weren't bothered by that, though. OK, keep going. Another shot of it. We had to put in a chimney and a uh, propane tank in order to heat it. Go ahead. All right. This is for so me. yours? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So by this time, it, uh, Donovan was also coming to New York to uh, do the path work with me and working with John there and also, well, one of the other helpers. And we were invited to join in the leadership group around Eva, which was very uh, empowering and exciting. I've often felt that it was, it was in meeting John that Donovan found his empowerment he, to, f to follow his heart with me and to follow his calling. And the same was really true for me in meeting Eva. This was the woman who helped me trust the feminine path to God. So we were radiating something at this point. We were pretty excited. We, we had jumped in with both feet and everything we had. So yeah. we started attracting people here. Here's Keith with his and then wife Lenny, uh, Ian and Kay McNett. Kay is Kay Slaughter from Charlottesville, she former is. mayor of Charlottesville. Yeah. Uh, Mon and Karen Ahrens, trained therapists who um, learned the path work from us. Ann Griever. And that's uh, Alan, who's here tonight, and Bill Griever, who's here tonight. <laughs> And others who came, but those were uh, f fairly soon on. We developed. We decided we needed. We wanted more than just us being the decision makers, because we we knew that this place had a destiny beyond us. Uh, we knew that from the beginning. We thought at first maybe it was going to be a Zen Buddhist place. We even had Zen monks living here for a while. We had a small resident community who lived. People who lived in the uh, house next door who came and we did uh, zazen, me zen meditation and yoga together and so on. But then when we met Eva, the direction became illuminated. And so we wanted more people involved in making decisions and we created the first advisory council. Oh, let me go back to that one. Uh, all of those people except us lived in DC, but people were coming out here two weekends a month to get the work. And they were uh, very that, turned on by it. That big next shot we're about to go to uh, is because uh, Eva, who was from Austria and had lived in Switzerland for a while, uh, loved to go to Switzerland for vacation. And she went every year in March, took the whole month of March off. That was her main vacation for skiing. And uh, we were, we'd only been in the Pathwork for maybe, in New York for maybe six months. But the people there started saying, you got to come to Arosa with us. you got to come to Arosa. I was very resistant. We already had reservations made for a, for a winter vacation camping in, on Saint, the island of St. John. And uh, they just kept saying, you need to come to Switzerland with us. I finally took the guidance again and heard yes. I was really sort of irritated to hear that. <laughs> but, but I got a clear sense, yes. So um, we went to Arosa. It was quite a big deal for uh, uh, Susan to go on a skiing uh, vacation since she had never skied before. And to, to learn your first lessons in the Alps is a little daunting. <laughs> I spent most of the time in ski classes with three-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's, the, the person on the left is Barbara Brennan. A lot of, a lot of I don't even know about her. And uh, Bert and Moira Shaw, who were um, very close to Eva, me in uh, black and blue, and uh, Bill Solomon and Adrian Winogrand. Go ahead. There's another shot of me on the left and Susan with Claire Solomon. Uh, Claire Solomon was, uh, uh, was my helper for a while in the New York path, and John still did bioenergetics with me. But it was Claire who asked me a very interesting question one time. She said, don't you want to be involved in something that's bigger than your own well-being? Don't you want to be involved in a cause that is something more than just you want to maximize your own life? Uh, I think I do. Yeah. I think that's what we're doing at Seven Oaks. I think it sort of like put it into focus for us better. 
So the, uh, the big thing about this trip, though, it was our first time to Switzerland, and, and uh, it, was, it, was a very, it, was it was a way to be very intimate with, with John and Eva. We, we spent days together skiing, and then we would have meals together <laughs> in the evening. And then she would, Eva would also, uh, about twice, I think, in the month, she would have a, an evening where we would all gather in her room, and she would go into trance and channel the guide for a question and answer session. So this is a very intimate chance to ask the guide a question about you, personally. And so um, in this session, the guide session that at one time, I asked the guide, I said, uh, as thoughts come into my mind that it would be right to uh, transform Seven Oaks, which is where we do our work now, into a pathwork center. And would you please comment on that? And Eva was sitting there. She often sat, sort of sat like this when she was in trance. And she, uh, she turned strongly to my direction. And in her guide voice said, yes, you have, you have read the call correctly. We are happy in the spirit world that you have heard the message clearly. And you can be sure that you will receive all the help you need, both in the people from uh, human beings and from the spirits. Wow. So that was a very strong answer. And uh, I believed it. it. It upset me some, or I had difficulty with it, but I also believed it. Uh, it was a very large result of the trip to Arosa. Uh, we took a, we took a uh, page from Eva's book, and then we started, said, so let's go on vacation with our closest followers. So this was a trip we took to the Virgin Islands, the British Virgins. Uh, one of, there's one other man who's Ron Aarons who was taking the picture. But it's the people who were really working hard with us to create this center at that time. So back at Seven Oaks, when we had spare time, <laughs> we were here doing groups and doing, uh, beginning to build this sense of community here. And we also started having regular spiritual ceremonies. This is a Easter ceremony that we had in 1975. We did all of our big events under the oaks because, remember, we had no large meeting space. The, the only meeting space we had was outdoors. So for a number of years, any time we needed to schedule a big event, it was scheduled under the oaks, and every time we had good weather. We also had a beginning dance company. So we uh, had become convinced that the guidance that we received in Arosa was real, that the destiny of this place was to become a pathwork center. So, uh, Although at, at, at that time, time yeah, you know, at that time, th we didn't use the word pathwork. Uh, it was simply the path, which was a little arrogant, we later <laughs> realized, but <laughs> we called it the path. And we, uh, but the property in Phoenicia that was the reason why the, the, the excuse for the New York region becoming organized as a legal entity, they became organized as the Center for the Living Force. That was John's name for it. And this was before Star Wars, but <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> it was, but it was how John felt the work. The work was uh, really enlivening the force of life within us. So we, we decided Yes, that's what we are. We are going to be a center for the living force. So we held a dedication ceremony. Of course, we invited John and Eva to come, but jo Eva had just received a diagnosis of the recurrence of her uh, breast cancer, which she had had 15, 20 years before, earlier. So she couldn't be there. Uh, this is a picture of the chairs being set out for the ceremony taken from the dormer, one of the dormers at Oak House. Since we couldn't, since many people came down from New York, and all of our members, which were, you know, somewhere between 20 and 40 maybe then, most of them came, and we couldn't, uh, you know, do anything indoors because there wasn't enough space. We we erected a tent for our dining, <coughs> and one of our people decided to cook beef Wellington in Oak House, which was then carried on trays out to the eating tent. For the, for the crew. That's John Saley in the purple sweater. So there's the eating tent. We did a core class outside. 
and a number of New York leaders came to honor this dedication. Uh, here is the ceremony itself with us and uh, Maura and Bert Shaw, who have been all these years many uh, very important leaders in the New York region. Also, John and Judith Saley, who started with Eva in the mid-50s. Well, here's John and Judith, John in the ceremony, me after the ceremony. And we were exceedingly happy that we were doing what we felt fully as God's work. Donovan's son David had come to live with us and came to the ceremony and got involved with the work for a while. After the ceremony, there was, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, there was a, a, a really interesting cloud phenomenon. There's a small white cloud and the sun was right behind it and it was shining through in such a way I've never seen it before or since. It was just like a, it was like a, I don't know, spectacular uh, uh, event in the sky and I pointed to it and everyone else was struck by it and uh, someone snapped this picture as we were all sky gazing. <laughs> so we took the whole group which was called the Washington Path up to Phoenicia which was then called the Center for the Living Force once a year for several years running and this is some pictures from that. We rented a Trailways bus, we got all the folks in the bus and went from Washington DC up to Phoenicia New York Center. This is one of the old buildings there, the dining room in Phoenicia, our group in front of the dining room, uh, a spiral dance event that we did a lot in the 70s. <laughs> this is Eva channeling John's in front. If you haven't seen a picture of her, just take it in for a moment. Yeah. At this point in our lives, we were, well, surely you would call us fanatics and maybe other names, but we were completely uh, gung-ho. And we were, we were traveling to DC you know, once a week to do sessions and groups. We had pathwork groups on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. Then t every, other mo every other week we would go to New York for the channeling with Eva and have our own sessions and be with the leadership group. And one year we would go to Phoenicia once a month in addition to that, which is another two and a half hours. Uh, so we would go to any major event at Phoenicia because we felt very involved with their work as well. And w one of the events that they did, which touched us a lot, was the, those people who had been married, but of course not been married by Eva and the guide, decided we wanted a remarriage ceremony. We were about five and a half years married by that time and... Uh, needed a shot in the arm. Needed a shot in the arm. <laughs> We'd been a rough, <laughs> intense five years. So here is us being remarried. Ready to go. We had a center for a while in uh, in the city. We had a center in Bethesda uh, that we rented and uh, Susan and I did our sessions there and we had a community meeting once a month and some other helpers also had, had rooms there to give sessions. Next. That's the sign out front. Here's the building. It was a nice place. You can go ahead, keep going. This is an help, early helper named Cindy Metz standing at the open door to the place. Keep going. And one of the things that we did to raise money was we created what we call the pleasure fair which it was a great success. Again, depended on good weather, always had good weather. And we, this is one of our main fundraisers. Here is Charles Blair getting his face painted. <laughs> uh, we did face painting and costumes and, you know, just lots of fun activities. Tarot readings, fortune telling. So uh, by the next year we were ready to actually turn over ownership of the land. It, it, we, you know, it took a couple of years of legal, sh legal finaglings and shenanigans to work it all out. Uh, but uh, I love this land. Susan and I love this land. It's the only place we ever owned, but we felt fully ready to give it away. And we gave it away with no conditions whatsoever. And uh, you can move on. Here's uh, 
Birchaw, uh, uh, with, is that Zweifeidem? No, it's Adrian. Okay. Uh, he's accepting the, the deed from us. Go ahead. That's, I think, the moment at which uh, Bert and I hugged after the ceremony. That's Susan with Bert. Eva was still sick, and so yeah. Eva and John. We kept hoping coming. they would come, but she, she was really fighting her, fighting this recurrence of cancer. And at the, at the end of this time, we did a, uh, a blessing for a new building we had in mind. Uh, on the, we'd finally torn down the old barn completely, and we were going to put up a center building. And this was a huge jump for us, because at this time we only had uh, oak house and corn crib, and this, we were planning to put a really big new building with a commercial kitchen and a big dining room and meeting rooms and offices. And it was just was like, felt like a lot to take on and a lot to bite off. And so we had a ceremony at, at the, around the, we circled the place, circled this, the site and blessed it. And then the man on the right, Richard Bianchini, was a member of ours and a training helper, helper in training who uh, was going to be the general contractor. And that was the, that's the barn that we tore down. That's carrying the, the foundation of that barn out. And here is the, here's the building under construction. We started this building uh, without all the money we needed. Uh, I forget how much it cost, but it was over 200,000. It was maybe about 240. And we didn't have that much, but we were getting gifts from our members. And something about the, the very recent gift from us of the whole land inspired a lot of generosity in people and a lot of money came in and uh, we got the place about two-thirds built and we ran out of money and uh, so uh, Richard says what do we do now Donovan that's a picture that was taken by the Madison Eagle sort of posed of us working in the building and uh, Richard says well, what do we do and so I knew that uh, a member of ours named Jenna Brown told me she had just gotten an inheritance so I went to her and I said could you loan us seventy thousand dollars to complete the building and she said, yeah. <laughs> Some few years later, she was fully paid back. But that's what we just, we just were trusting a lot. Uh, so there's Karen Ahrens, one of our helpers on the new deck, completely completed building. And you can see that the trees hadn't grown up. So you can see the mountains from a lot of places. You can see the mountains very clearly from that new deck. <clears throat> More shots of the building. So. In April of 1978, Eva made her a one and only visit to Seven Oaks to dedicate Center Building. Uh, this is on Oak House Lawn with uh, people most involved in the building of this building. Donovan Jerome was the architect, Richard was the contractor, Bert was the we're all, path, we're all in the pathway. Yeah. And here is Eva leaving Oak House. She, we set up a opportunity on Oak House Lawn for her to meet and talk with uh, all of us because we, this me and John, it's all of us sitting there and Eva and John on the Oak House Lawn. We did the ceremony in Center Building to dedicate the building and this is a wonderful <coughs> picture of the two of them taken outside the doors which Allen Hill made. So center building immediately became the heart and center of our community. And it is geographically the, ac the actual center of the property. And it's oriented direct north, south, east, west. Uh, so it became, you know, obviously our center for eating and for socializing. One of the early things that took place there, you can see that the walls aren't quite finished, was a bar mitzvah of Juan Aaron's son. We also had a christening of Keith and Lenny's son, a wedding, been many weddings. And the training, first training class that we that completed training uh, here was in, the, we graduated them in center building. And at that time, in fact, for many years, until we built this building, every, every day that we had groups here, we were moving furniture. We would put the tables up for breakfast and down for group and up for lunch and down for <laughs> core class. And you know, it was furniture moving felt like one of the uh, 
uh, necessary requirements of being a helper. So, in March of 1979, Eva died. Uh, and this is the, we had the memorial service at Phoenicia, of course, and this little area here was called Eva's Island because she used to come there and love to sunbathe and this pond was Eva's pond. It's John and me. And he had this uh, okay. bouquet of roses in a heart shape that he, I think, with her ashes in it and he let them go in the pond. So barely catching our breath, we barely finished all of that, and we built our own house. <laughs> the we've, been living, we've been living for uh, seven years in Oak House in half of the upstairs attic, and uh, with groups going on around us all the time, it was hectic. So we were dreaming of let's get, build a house a little farther away from the center of things, so this was it. Me on the construction. It's our future living room. And this is the photo that earned for Pam, the, uh, our daughter, the description of our house as the golden house. <laughs> and this is the view from our house, or was then. We can't see that now, it's all trees. But there's Oak House, Corn Crib, Center Building. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the 1970s. So, <laughs> it was a long decade. <laughs> a very packed decade. <laughs> All right, 1980. John came down a year after Eva's death and met with us again on the uh, front lawn of Oak House. Uh, we were probably collectively in a lot of denial still that about Eva's death, and we were kind of continuing with the momentum that had been generated. We really thought we'd be together for life. That, that whole group that, you know, some of whom you saw earlier, and the, in the early 80s that, that we were still tight together and really uh, committed to our paths, and we thought we'd be together for life. That's not what happened. Oh, Great. okay. Once again, we thought we needed more space, so uh, we were going to add on to uh, the site of Corn Crib, and we didn't know what to call the building yet, so we thought an amusing name was Corn Crib Towers. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we were not too solemn about it. Okay, there's the foundation being built. Uh, we took out a mortgage for this building. We had done so much fundraising for our members, we, thought we, we don't want to push the, push the envelope too much. Go ahead. There's a ceremony we did often when we got a building half finished, we would have a ceremony to give it the boost to finish. Go ahead. And there it is nearly complete. And there it is well uh, finished and integrated into the community. Yeah. The, a little while longer, we changed a little while after that, we added the, the room to uh, the center building that uh, we needed another big meeting space, and not just the one upstairs where we had to move furniture so much. And in 83 or 84, as I remember it, is when contraction really started to hit. Because uh, after Eva's death, I was surprised at the amount of fighting among the other leaders in New York that went on. I thought, wow, this is a really close group. But Eva was really at the core of it. And when she left, uh, people started fighting uh, for control and power and blah, 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 blah. who knows what. But it was, it was a mess. And, um, as word of that filtered down from New York to our region, uh, somehow, sort of like the bloom was off the rose, like, well, Eva's dead, and the guy's not channeling anymore. And so uh, one by one, all of the helpers, beginning helpers that we had trained, peeled off and left. A couple of moved to Boulder, Colorado. A couple of just, stayed, you know, it was, it, was, it was very disheartening, extremely disheartening. Um, at times, I had thoughts about, and what was the guy telling me about uh, transforming this into a, into a center for Eva's teachings? Like, uh, where is everybody now? That, and uh, uh, I remember thinking sometime during the 80s, like, well, these were the Reagan years. And I, the, the thought came to me, like, 
any spiritual community that survives the Reagan years has passed some major test. And if we, <laughs> if we can get through this decade with, with this <laughs> terrible administration, <laughs> I'm sorry to all Republicans, <laughs> if, through all, if we can get through the 80s, uh, we will be stronger for it. You know, this is just like, we're not, this is not an expansion time. It's holding on and not dying. And that's the way it felt. It was like, we're just holding on, we're doing the best we can, uh, and we're not collapsing. We're not, we're not fading away. So with the work drying up some, my, my attention turned where, uh, turned to the, my longing to have a child. And lo and behold, my daughter, Pamela Tsenga, came to us in 1982 when she was, we adopted her when she was 11 months old. She's with us tonight. And here's Pam in front of the Golden House. is Pam and the Oak House with uh, Carol's dog, Skippy, who became part of the community. <laughs> Toward the end of the 80s, we had a, a children's summer program. And with the children of the Covington, the Jacob Covington and the Griever children, Pam and Alex Hill. In the 80s also, with fewer people coming to our programs, we started uh, looking around for what else, what else interested us. And uh, I, it, it seemed to me that we got out of the buildings and we moved out in the land much more. And so we noticed, I noticed this, this muddy little hole down at the bottom of the uh, uh, forest that we decided we could create a pond. And, uh, we're missing some slides. You jumped ahead of us, no, right? No. Okay. This is this is we we hired a bulldozer to do the work, but there was also an awful lot of, of uh, person labor that we could use to uh, put the pond in shape. You can see the the pine forest that we planted. That's behind the plant. It. The forest we planted behind it, growing up about half grown at that point. More shots under construction. Yeah, and here's the completed product. Uh, when it was first completed, it was really lovely for swimming. The water was clear, and it was a lot of fun, and the kids loved it. And it's deteriorated now, but for many years, it was like really a, a lovely addition. And part of it was, move ahead, yeah, in winter, move ahead again. Part of it was, this was part of our movement into Native American programs. Uh, when we were looking to see, like, what else, what else is calling us? Uh, the Native American wisdom was a strong element, and I took two trips, two different trips to North Carolina to meet with Indian Native American teachers and one long journey to North Dakota for the same purpose and came back and we, putting in the pond was part of it, putting in sweat lodges was part of it. Uh, I walked the land all over the, every, every inch of it, I think, there are places I haven't been before to look for vision quest sites where we would hold Native American vision quests and invite people to come out. We charged almost nothing for it in keeping with, with Native practices. And uh, it was like a whole new, way of uh, being. Next slide. That's, that's how Darlene came to us as a, 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 yes. on a vision quest. Did a vision quest first <laughs> and then wrote a few lectures. <laughs> I thought we had Mary Janet. On, we uh, do next. Oh, she's coming up? Oh yeah. Mary Janet Fowler came to join us. She was very much into Native American wisdom. And as part of that, we decided to put in Medicine Wheel, which is like a Native American church, uh, holy place. The woman in blue was the leader of it. Mary and, Janet behind her. Pardon me? Mary Janet's right behind. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, uh, the woman named Carol Jean McFarland was a worker of mine for some time who uh, got very connected here, developed cancer, died, and her ashes are scattered here. And she gave, left a bequest to the center. There's Carried her, us through the 80s. Again. Yeah. Hmm. And another shot is, uh, that's our daughter Pamela dressed as an eagle. She's so much like an eagle, you can't see her at all. So she's just all <laughs> eagle. <laughs> Five-year-old eagle. Yes. Right. And there's the woman who was in charge. And, we're, and here's the completed medicine wheel. OK, this became an important place to a lot of people who, who uh, after they did their work, would come up and leave an offering or make a prayer or, you know, like, you know this is a place to, to feel spirit, Out, the outdoor spirit, the mother spirit. Okay. So since we couldn't afford to put up buildings, we created an outdoor church. Yeah. <laughs> so at this, during this period, we kind of were looking around and saying, well, we've had a great exodus. Who's here? And let's get together. 
and we did. We created what we called the Unity Group. Uh, we had a, the seven, and it turned out there were seven of us, uh, with a shared interest in Native American spirituality. And th those seven people were, we called ourselves the Unity Group. We didn't say we were formative <laughs> leaders because we didn't know that, but it was two of us, and Carol Hunt, and Keith Covington, Mary Janet, Alan, and Lonnie. We're here now. It was a, and most of us lived on the property. Carol and Mary Janet lived in Oak House, Alan lived here. Uh, later, Lonnie joined him when she came down for weekends. Keith lived close by. And together, we ran the center. Carol was the center manager, Alan and Mary Janet on the grounds, Keith in finance and maintenance. And then Keith, Carol, and Alan became helpers, and later Lonnie became helpers. We met together very intensively uh, for at least a day, maybe even a weekend, a month maybe not a month, but every other month or so, where we really, the goal was what stands in the way of our experiencing complete unity with one another. We know we are one at the, at the level, at the spiritual level. What stands in us in the way of knowing that unity? It's a very powerful motivator to do the work. So we did a lot of work together. Uh, obviously, like all work then, flawed in some ways, but it was very inspiring to come together with that as the goal. We will feel our unity with one another, and we will own and transform whatever stands in the way. We were also inspired by a wonderful story that Scott Peck told when he was here about learning to see one another as the Messiah, as uh, to see one, one another as one's own, as the higher self. That is who we are. The rest comes with the package, but that is who we are. So that was inspiring. And out of that also came uh, the building of the small sanctuary in the woods that Alan headed up. <coughs> That's the small you know, sanctuary without walls. And the finished sanctuary. And Alan and Lonnie were married in front of that, in front of the uh, stained glass window there. They were married by Pam Chubbuck, who was a bioenergetic therapist in Atlanta, who also led a lot of workshops here. There have been many, many weddings at Seven Oaks, uh, many under the oaks. I think this is the only one at the little sanctuary, uh, many, many inside. I, I recently talked to a woman in uh, Richmond who, she and her partner, who's a woman, they had a, a marriage ceremony under the Oaks 20 years ago, and she said, we, were, we felt fully married in that ceremony, and it has endured, and now, 20 years later, they're going to be able to get married legally. Uh, Barbara Brennan was someone that we knew very well, and. Uh, she was from this area, from D.C., and then she moved to the Phoenicia Center and then back to this area. And she and I co-led a workshop at Seven Oaks once in the early days. And uh, we got along very well. We like we liked working together. And when she started her, when her book came out and she started getting famous and started her training program, she uh, did her first training program at Seven Oaks and later moved to her, a place in Long Island and then down to Florida where she stayed for a long time. At the Just, end of the training, the, the first training that they did here, Alan, I know, was in that training and some others uh, that we knew. At the end of that training, they planted a little oak tree. This is the oak tree that you see off the deck of Center Building. In the mid-'80s, we started uh, when once we needed, we needed to bring in new people. So we started looking at, all right, who, who are outside leaders that we can bring in and sponsor? Next slide. Yeah. And, uh, we, Actually, I was going to talk about this. You were going to talk about yeah. that. We, I thought so. <laughs> we, uh, it, was, it was part of the effort to, to kind of move beyond, in a, uh, move, expand the pathwork, I guess you could say, from the intense work we had done for those uh, 10 years 
And then we started looking elsewhere. So Native American spirituality was part of where we looked, and we were also looking to bring in other influences and other uh, streams of spiritual teaching into Seven Oaks. And we held a conference on what was then called uh, spiritual politics and economics, new age politics. I don't know if that can be is used anymore, but a number of people who were who became uh, famous with that, like Hazel Henderson and Barbara Marks Hubbard and Gordon Davidson, Corinne McLaughlin, Mark Satin. Here's here's a shot of Corinne, Corinne and Mark Satin, and. Uh, we also debated bringing in M. Scott Peck, who was the author of a really big bestseller then, uh, The Road Less Traveled. I thought it was a wonderful book. We were nervous that he would cost a lot, and we didn't know if people would come, but we decided to, yes, we would invite him. And it was a huge success. He filled the place, and uh, many people came to the workshop who'd never been here before. And I had a great time with him. We had a long talk on at my house. I found him a really wonderful man. And it was part of reaching out and bringing in new people with, uh, uh, who didn't want to sign up for a course, but wanted to, wanted to meet good people. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was another really good choice. We brought her here for a couple of times, but one, one very interesting time, we invited her and a man on the next slide, Robert Gass, who had a, was the head then of a uh, musical group called On Wings of Song. And uh, we put together a program that we had at the Paramount Theater in downtown Charlottesville, uh, featuring Elizabeth Kubler-Ross doing her speech and then uh, interspersed with Robert Gass and his group singing and then we would hear from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross again. It was like really a, a fantastically interesting creative evening and we had a lot, of cr a lot of people who came to that program and signed up their name and address and so we added to our mailing list and it was reaching out, finding ways to reach out and expand. Go ahead. We also had sponsored several Native American teachers, Rolling Thunder, Sunber Sunbear, Mm -hmm. And I was especially interested in Rolling Thunder's visit here because he walked the land with us and he pointed out to us because he had this into knew this is where they camped. This is where they, the, you know, he, he knew where the, the, where the uh, native people had been on this land and pointed out the oak grove as a sacred space as well. So we also brought in Michael Harner who was kind of the the person who most brought shamanism to the consciousness of Western mentality. Uh, he had, was an anthropologist, is an anthropologist, went, did a lot of work, field work in South America, and I was particularly interested in talking to him about his work in the Amazon, the Amazon rainforest and his work with shamans there and their use of psychoactive sacred plants as part of their shamanism. So at this point, I think some of the energy that we generated by the seven of us loving each other and by the, the outside energy that we were bringing in, and we were also all this time continuing to do path work, but it was small and started to begin to grow. And here some really uh, formative leaders who have stayed with us came then. Alegria Barbara Strauss, Jeff Fischel, who has moved on. Uh, Nancy Lang is here. Uh, she lived also on the property for a while, a, a therapist in Richmond. Here she is with Carol and Alegria. And here tonight with us, our beloved Darlene and John Byrell came. Both of them also, as I say, having an interest in the Native American. We had a small resident community, partly because we were doing so few workshops and we weren't filling the place anymore we invited people to live in Holly House. So we had a whole uh, resident community. And our beloved Karen came in the 80s as well. And Carl, who is here tonight, I love this shot of him and Donna, came in the late 80s. This is a picture of the Seven Oaks staff at that time. So you can see the staff had expanded also. So there was, there was definitely more business. There were, trans we started transformation programs again, but they were small. Here's some of the people who were students at that time. Okay, we've moved to the 90s. We survived the 80s, guys. 
We did, and it was like really like, oh, all right. The, the decades here have varied between the 70s were a time of great expansion, the 80s were holding on, contraction, the 90s was also a time of great expansion, and we feel like the 2000s have been sort of contraction and holding on. And our decades always start in about 72, 82, 92, and 1002. And so uh, we think now with uh, 1002 to 1012 behind us, there's, we don't know, but something new is going to be starting now in 1013, because this is 2013, because this is a new decade. There was a big debate in New York about do we publish the guide lectures? And some people were very timid about it. The, the people in New York had published that book in the background, Guide Lectures for Self Transformation. Uh, just for members, and it didn't get much, you know, beyond that. And uh, I was one of the people who was saying, let's get the word out to the bigger world. And I had an, an ally in New York and Judith Saley, and the two of us run the foundation board at that time. And so we were really aiming to try to get the, the uh, books published. Lo and behold, we arranged a meeting with one of the editors at Bantam Books, and Judith and I went to meet with her, and they were willing to publish a book. And uh, I'm the one who said, a guide lectures is a really unsexy title. You know, like <laughs> lectures, guide, you know. So, so I came up with the pathwork of self-transformation, and, and Bantam liked that title. And that sort of settled in that there, our name was going to be the pathwork. Uh, the corporation still was officially Center for the Living Force Incorporated, but Judith and I on the board kept pushing for a vote, and we have finally made it the Pathwork Foundation. Inc. And uh, that's what it's been since then. So we also then became officially Seven Oaks Pathwork Center. Yes, and around that same time, Susan and I had been <coughs> examining what was happening at Phoenicia in terms of uh, uh, the way they taught Pathwork, and they just called it training class, training class. And that's what we called it at first, but that's, that's not very good either. So we came up with a Pathwork Transformation Program, and, that's, and we also changed the nature of what was taught in Phoenicia a lot. We added a lot more core energetics they, were, they tended to be much more conceptual and talky, and we were more in the body and active. But we changed a lot of the program around, called it the Pathwork Transformation Program. And over time, other Pathwork regions adopted that same name. So in 1990, we held the first international Pathwork Conference, uh, which was held here at, Se at Seven Oaks. Two years previous to that, the Dutch had held a large meeting of all their members, and we were the only non-Dutch people who went. So we conceived the idea then of creating an international conference, which we then did every two years for many years. But the first one was held here. These are some of the people. We had representatives from US regions in New York, Philadelphia, Michigan, California, and then Europe, Holland, uh, Italy. I think maybe the German guy was there one person from Australia and from Africa. We have have or had two helpers in Africa, two African helpers. Uh, this is the group that came from the Netherlands. The woman with me is Carolyn Tyla, who started the Philadelphia Pathwork, which is still going strong. And the two guys to the left, Brian O'Donnell and Michael Robley, were from Michigan. Gene Humphrey had originally been from Michigan. In fact, he helped start the pathwork there, and then he and his wife moved. Well, go, he and his wife moved to California and started the pathwork there. At this conference, uh, Michael Robley met his future wife, Iris Markham, who was then from New York. And this is a lovely picture of Gene and Peg. Gene and Peg have been uh, played an important role here throughout, and then. This sort of remarkable thing happened that we were invited to teach pathwork in Brazil. And we were invited by a psychologist who lived in Salvador, Bahia, on the northeast coast of Brazil. And we jumped in with both feet and went. And this is a picture of us teaching later in Sao Paulo, which was, is the largest city in South America, huge metropolis. Uh, but we started out teaching in this beautiful coastal town of uh, Salvador, Bahia. Uh, and this is a picture of one of the Brazil groups. It was an extraordinary expansion for us teaching Pathwork there, because the Brazilian culture is just steeped in spirituality. It's the ground they walk on. It's so uh, different from 
it, well, it depends on which, you know, who you're talking to, really, but the culture in general is much more spiritually inclined. The religion of spiritism, which has to do with contacting spirits and channeling spirits and depossessing negative spirits and all that, has millions of members in Brazil. That there was a, the shamanism is just much more part of the culture. The native indigenous cultures there uh, and the African slave cultures, the African culture and the indigenous culture were not suppressed nearly the way they were in this country. We set out in this country to annihilate not just the people, but the culture. That's not true there. It's alive. It's, uh, and anyway, their Indians could retreat to the jungle where no one could get them, <laughs> so, unlike what we did with our Indians. So there's a much more of a feeling of infusion of spirit. They're also a very emotional, heart-centered people, so they, it, was, it was really a trip to do path work in Brazil because we would do what in North, in North America, you know, you kind of have to coax the feelings to come and, you know, and these women mostly were out there with their dramatic feelings at the drop of a hat. <laughs> Pathwork changed because of Brazil. Um, now, you. Okay. While we were there, we also uh, encountered and got deeply into a Brazilian indigenous spiritual path called the Santo Daim. This is an outgrowth of a, of a, uh, uh, group started in the Amazon, and they use a psychoactive substance that's made by plant, but boiling two different plants together. And uh, I first signed up for a uh, month-long immersion in this uh, process. Uh, this is a picture of the, the environment that it was in, uh, the Valley of Mawa. That's Susan, the first person walking in, our friend Marianne Scopin behind her. is a really spectacular, beautiful setting. And uh, I went there often. The first time I went was for a month-long immersion, and uh, it was strong. I mean, I, you know, it was foreign, it was strange, it was weird. No one spoke English. And uh, I was singing and dancing Portuguese hymns all night long. There's Susan later on she went with me, and then she's meditating there by the river that creates the valley that uh, is Mawa Valley. There's the local church. It's uh, quite a very simple but it's the heart of the community, and uh, many ceremonies are held there, I mean, several a week. And uh, everyone in Brazil has, loves uniforms, so these are the uniform of the church, and uh, this, uh, the women singing and dancing. There's a, there's a great emphasis on singing and dancing to arouse your spirit and arouse your feelings. And everyone, it's not free form, however, everyone does the same steps and the same words, so if you do this hour after hour, it's kind of a, a diminishing of your ego and your sense of being a separate person and you be, feel like a part of this big dynamo of 50 people or 100 people in the church all doing the same thing hour after hour. And it's, uh, it's consciousness changing in a way that I had not experienced before. It's, it's just really intense, real shamanism, not just thinking about it or daydreaming about it or fantasizing about it. It's like really doing it. This is a small house that Susan and I bought there. It was more like a shack, but uh, we lived there one time for four and a half months in a row. And then at other times, whenever we would go down to Brazil to teach a week-long training, we would also then spend a week in our little house in Mawa. These are two pictures that show uh, stages of the creation of the dime. Uh, as I say, it's like uh, two plants, which in the Amazon don't grow close together at all. One is a vine and one's a bush. But somehow the natives discovered that if you, and if you t take them separately, they have no effect. But the natives discovered if you boil them together, they have a powerful psychoactive effect. And they're called, they're one of a, a, a family of plants called entheogens, which means uh, tending to give you an experience of God, tending to give you, uh, get you closer to uh, Theos, Dios, God. There's the drink on the, on the altar table, the, the brown liquid, and a man in the upper right taking a drink. That's a small building called the Healing House in Moa. Some of the most intense works were held there because it's, there's only about 12 people can fit in there. And it's like uh, the man who was in charge of that community, the head of that community, was a, was a um, psychiatrist from Rio de Janeiro, Jose Rosa, who became my teacher 
And it was really wonderful to have a teacher like that because he would sit next to me in that building, very close, close quarters, and uh, observe me for the four or five hours we were there, and then give me feedback later about, here's where you sort of screwed up, and here's where you were jiggling around, and you should have been really still, and it was like right on one-to-one -one teaching about, from a shaman about how to do it. And uh, I learned a lot, and uh, a lot of our friends did too. We also then went into the Amazon forest to experience the, the center of where this uh, church came from. And uh, you get there by traveling and by plane as far as you can go. And then you take a car as far as you can go. And then you come to this little town called Boca de Acre. Uh, and then you must take a canoe. And at the time I first went, it was two full days in a canoe. And you slept, you know, you got off half the way there in, in the bank and put your hammock between two trees. And then you got back on the next day of canoe. And uh, it was exciting <laughs> and onerous. Uh, here I am on one trip through Moa. I'm about half the way there. Mapia. Right? Mapia, I mean, the, the village in the Amazon. There were some otherworldly environments that you passed through. Go ahead. Uh, we're approaching Mapia village. You can see the uh, jungle and the canoes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's a sample of, we don't see the village itself, but you see a sample of what the environment's like. Three pictures, like the upper right is the supermarket. <laughs> Um, when I first went there in 1994, there was no store at all. Any food that you were going to eat there, if you didn't live there, you had to bring with you in the canoe. I mean, it was like loaves of bread, cheese, whatever, whatever you're going to eat. If you wanted to eat it, you had to bring it. Uh, now there's a, there's a store and, and things you can buy. Lower left is the church, the center of the community. Lower right are canoes, and as you can see, one of them is filled with bricks. If you want bricks for your house, you have to canoe them in, and there was just <laughs> quite a chore. It's, it's different now, but uh, back then that's the way it was. This is this is going through the uh, Amazon. I mean the uh, Amazon forest uh, in the area of the of the village. So it was a uh, a powerful thing to go to Brazil and teach and also to learn. I would say, I mentioned before that when I was at in guide lectures. In the early days, I felt in the presence of the divine and drinking dime in the rainforest was my next most powerful, my next powerful experience of being in the presence of the divine. After exploring Brazil a lot, we also thought we wanted to see what it's like in Peru because it's very different. Uh, and so Susan and I went to the Peruvian Amazon once and this is this, the second time when I went without Susan. So the uh, man that I was hugging before is also the man who's canoeing that boat going into the Peruvian Amazon. So meanwhile, <laughs> back at Seven Oaks, uh, the energy started really taking off. Everything, remember, was being done in center building because that's where all of the classes were held. In this winter when we were in Brazil, was a major snowfall, and the whole transformation program class was trapped in Seven Oaks for three days, uh, two or three days, I can't remember. And I, it was a, when that class graduated, I remember many of them saying that was the most memorable part of their time here because the, the doing community when you're in a class with a teacher and so on is one thing, but doing community when you're holed up here for two days and you're not sure you're gonna have enough food, you know, that was, that was a really deep experience for all of them. That's what it looked like then. Here's a uh, tr transformation cl program class toward the end of the uh, group. I think a couple of those people are here tonight. We started a counselor training and helper training. And you can see from the number of people here that by the end of the 90s, there was a lot of people and a lot of interest. One of the programs we started, we actually started this uh, even in the end of the 80s when there, we were really uh, connecting to the indigenous spirituality of this land, of North America, and we wanted to strengthen our connection to the, the land and to one another and we did <laughs> we did programs we called Woman Earth Spirit. We built uh, 
icons to the goddess and carried her around the campus. <laughs> this is a great picture if you can see some of the people in here. That we, we had people coming for this program, and people coming from Michigan and Colorado and all over, and it, uh, a lot of people who came from far away. It's Carol and Alegria leading a women's circle under the oaks. I think this was the last one that we did and that Mary Jane and Alegria and I led. And we also started doing men's workshops, men's circles. This is John Byro leading a men's circle down at the river. Keith and John and Kent became you know, the main leaders for that, the men's work. And here is Joe Johnson, who was at least with us a little earlier, uh, been with us for many years. During the 90s, we held a number of other leadership events. Uh, we, I mentioned that Gene Humphrey was important here. He used to lead the helpers in our retreats. It was very important to get somebody from outside the region who could help us with our interpersonal dynamics and so on. That's another one of a a later retreat also led by Jean. I think Alan and Lonnie moved on by that time and Marianne had moved to Brazil. And some other people had come, like uh, Joan Advent and Kaki Brooks became an important leader here and Janelle, so on. This has got Jim Anderson, who's here tonight, and his wife Terry. We also had leadership events, we, all the whole East Coast of Pathwork leaders met in Philadelphia. Just love that slide of me and Judith. And this is Donna Evans Strauss, who's some of you know through Barbara Brennan, and she also has done, done workshops here. Karen, Donovan, and me. So uh, in the early 90s, we decided we wanted to get a lot more Pathwork books published. And we decided we wanted to be in charge of our own material rather than wait to see when a publishing company would bring them out. So next, next to, so uh, that's Susan's first book in the, in the middle, The Undefended Itself. My first book, Fear No Evil, and my second book, Surrender to God Within. These were all published by Pathwork Press. This was started by me and Gene Humphrey. Uh, and uh, Karen Milnick did a lot of the technical work of, of getting the books out. Following that, we also brought out a book that Judith Saley edited, Creating Union, and uh, many of them started to get translated into uh, well, lots of languages. Most of the European languages, uh, Dutch first, and then German and Italian, and one book in French, and uh, then the, uh, we got books published in uh, Latin America in Spanish and Portuguese. There's not Temo Sumal, the, the Portuguese version, uh, a lot of people who I met in Brazil said, I know your book. Uh, and they'd say, Sao Jorge na capa, which means St. George on the cover. Sao Jorge na capa. And I said, well, yes. <laughs> it was, for some reason, it was a good seller in Brazil. And uh, at the time that uh, uh, Gene Humphrey and I sort of stepped back from active publishing, we asked Tom Hubbard if he would take it over. And he very kindly said yes. And Zoe Willow was his assistant. In the, I think about 1994, I also put together my own summary of Steps on the Path, which was kind of my summary of all the work that there can be done on the spiritual path. My chart came into being as a, as a rainbow event uh, because I told these ideas to my friend Asha Greer, who was a spiritual teacher and artist in Charlottesville. And she put it all down in this marvelous tablecloth she painted. <laughs> and we went around in various places and talked together about the uh, levels of the work. It was a lot of fun. I hope this isn't too much. I know it's cramming a lot. But the, the thing I want, want to try to convey is the path work that we have been given in these <coughs> lectures was capable of expanding much greater than it even has been developed today, but it certainly, it had developed a lot from the early 70s through the 90s and got bigger and bigger in terms of our understanding of what it means to do this work. And we're still now uh, introducing more the work of 
unit of consciousness, which is the going beyond all duality, all good and bad, into the experience of the oneness, of the one dance that is going on here. In uh, the 90s, we had a pretty substantial resident community, and we thought they were living mostly in Oak House, and we thought we need to construct a building really for the residents. And that was the essence of, wh of what got Morning Glory started. Next, next slide. We hired a, an architect, he said there on the left with Karen Milnick, and uh, we designed a building that uh, we thought would be for residents. And uh, by the time it was finished, actually two of the residents who were going to live there had moved out. So uh, it became essentially Karen Milnick's house, and the other rooms were used for visiting leaders. You can go ahead. Uh, under construction and nearly done and done. In the 90s, we had some dramatic uh, things happen on the land. Uh, three of our ancient oak trees fell. This tree was struck by lightning and died immediately. You see a circle of people kind of blessing the tree before it was taken down. And what we called the mother oak, we had the two oaks that kind of framed the view of the mountains, which, you know, in many of the mountain photos we have, you always see them framed by these two giant oaks. The one on the right we called the mother oak, which had a very expansive, sheltering presence. And the father oak was a more straight-up guy. And in the, when we had our first pathwork groups here in the mid-70s, one afternoon, there was a uh, summer storm and a lightning bolt came. I, I literally saw a ball of fire in the air that separated and struck both the trees simultaneously and went into the ground. And it was, I really almost heard a voice over that said, never <laughs> underestimate the power of the work that is being done here. <laughs> so we had a baptism by fire in the 70s and then 20 years later, even though we were able to rescue them for a while, they did both fall. We planted new oaks in the base of the mother and the father. We also had a, a, that the mother oak fell while we were in Brazil, and this flood happened while we were in Brazil. Uh, they call this a one in a century flood, and it actually we had them two in a row, 95 and 96. The entire lower 40 field was a lake. This is after the flood. We had all the trees were wiped out, and there was a huge deposit of sand. This is the river after the flood. So uh, ending up the 90s, we had the we had, as I mentioned, we had international pathwork conferences every two years through the 90s and actually for quite a while through the two early 2000s. Um, and so 98 was another conference here. This is a picture, uh, obviously, of, of the trustees at that time were Gene Humphrey. He was in charge of Pathwork Press in, uh, from California, John Paracas, Pat Rodegast, and Norfolk. Ann Griever, formerly Ann Griever, uh, Brian O'Donnell from Michigan, Louise Stevenson from Canada, and I was the president at that point. Uh, Judith Saley, Marjorie Baer from California. Marjorie Baer's had an impact here and uh, her teachings on especially the unit of level of the work is um, they're still being felt here. We also started having now the representation from the South. Andre Leites started the pathwork in Mexico, and we, by this time we had trained some helpers from Brazil who came. And it, this is a lovely woman from uh, Uruguay on the left and Argentina on the right who came for that conference. So the 98 conference was mostly going south, less, less Europe and more South America. In the 90s, we really had, uh, especially by the mid-90s, we really had big turnouts here again. Uh, Susan and I were leading four or five-day groups every big weekend, holiday weekend, like Memorial Day, Labor Day, New Year's, 
And we, we filled the place. We packed every place. And we oftentimes had to rent the bed and breakfast down the road to fill the overflow. And uh, we really just were pulling in a lot of people. And the books being out uh, helped a lot because they were bringing people from all over the country, not just from Maryland, Virginia, D.C. So we had a lot of people coming from regularly from uh, uh, the West Coast, for example. There's uh, one man, we have a picture of him that didn't, didn't wind up in here, named David Altschul, who lived in Portland, Oregon. He came to every one of our uh, four-day holiday groups for three years running. That's about nine or ten of those workshops he did in a row, all the way from commuting from Oregon. So uh, that's uh, part of the uh, uh, thinking that let us feel like we need a new building, <laughs> this one that we're in. And uh, part of that also was like there, we had a, uh, our, our regular uh, transformation program class. I think it's the same one that I think Zim started the same year as, as Kent Peterson. And there were 32 students in that class, the beginning class. It was like by far the biggest class. And we thought, wow. You know, this is, we need a new place. So we started uh, working on Lighthouse, the building you're in now. I originally was thinking like, well, we just, you know, we're tired of doing all that furniture moving in the center building. We just need like a big rectangular building on the ground that wouldn't cost too much. And uh, I started trying to promote it to people and everyone just had no interest whatsoever. So then talked to more, some more people and came up, we came up with the idea of what we need is not that at all. What we need is a two-story round building <laughs> with a big, great big open space sanctuary room up on top, the one that you're, the room you're in now. And so we started talking that up to people and they said, well, that sounds like good, that sounds good. I'll, I'll support that. And uh, we kept going, uh, working on this building, different shots. Two shots. The, that's the center pole that holds this entire floor. Yeah, <laughs> right. Keep going. Okay, we had it about uh, we had the center. We had this part about two thirds done and started running flagging energy. So we had a ceremony, of course, which uh, gives us a spiritual boost. So we uh, uh, gathered together for prayers and dancing and songs and and uh, dedications. That's Kent sitting up on the scaffolding. Uh huh. <laughs> Keep going. And here's another meeting, the same meeting at the same, same uh, dedication. And there's uh, Tom Hubbard up on top of the cupola. Uh, this building had uh, got started with a lot of help from Dottie Titus and towards the end we were flagging and uh, Tom Hubbard came in and, and uh, found the right architect to finish up the work for us. Keep going. That's the, that's, the round part having been built, we started having to build the, uh, the long uh, entryway. Which was Tom's inspiration. In yeah, to make a really substantial entryway. Other, other shots, other views. This different stages in construction. Yeah, and this is the, this is the people who were the uh, board of trustees at that time. It was really a, a good board. Zim Putney's there in the upper left. And uh, in the ground in front, there's Kaki Brooks and uh, Nancy Hiles Johnson. Uh, Kaki and Nancy and I were the people who uh, were charged with raising the money. And uh, Kaki and Nancy did a fantastic job. And uh, we didn't know how, any idea when we started what the building would cost. I, had, I had hesitated to try and figure it out because I thought the number would be too daunting. And uh, people would say, we'll never do it. But we just kept going and raising the money. And uh, we finally managed to get $750,000 in gifts from our members. I never thought it would be possible. I never thought the building would cost that much either, but it did. <laughs> and, but we found all the money and gifts from our members. One member alone gave more than $200,000. Quite a gift. Uh, that's the staff at that time in 2001. There, there, there's the finish view. It's a, quite, a, quite a lovely building. And it fits in, as you can see, with all the others. Same color roof, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're in the home stretch. <clears throat> so in our time here, Donovan and I have walked many paths from encounter groups to Zen Buddhism, from Christian mysticism to Amazonian shamanism, 
and of course, through it all, the pathwork. We've traveled from Big Sur, California, to New York, to rural Virginia, and back to New York, from snowy Arosa to sunny Caribbean, from Sao Paulo, vast, overcrowded Sao Paulo, to the remote Amazon. We've seen many sunsets through these oaks and many sunrises. And all our journeys, inner and outer, always bring us back to the same place of dancing in the light of our own being, which always shines brilliantly in each one of us, in every moment, here and now.